Genesis 48. So we're, uh, we're back to uh, an almost, almost at the end of our study uh, of, uh, of Genesis. <laughs> we're, we're approaching two years. If you, I'm sure you're not keeping track like I, I am, but uh, man, I, it's like a great, I hate to end good books, you know, and we're down to the last couple chapters. But uh, I'm, I'm, uh, the great thing about it is not anticlimactic. This is a, a, very, uh, a very special event that takes place uh, in the context is, is Jacob knows that he's dying. He's been in uh, Egypt for 17 years, uh, and he knows he's got very limited time left. And, uh, and so, uh, as many writers have said, that death has a way of clarifying the thoughts in the mind. And, uh, and Jacob is kind of zeroing in. There's a couple of things he's got to do, and there's a couple of things he's got to say. And uh, what he says to his son Joseph at this juncture of his life uh, is actually recorded for us or commented on in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11:21 says that by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning on the top of a staff. And what's interesting about that is you could read this chapter, maybe you heard it in a Sunday school story or saw it somewhere else in a movie sometime where Jacob is going to bless the sons of jo- Joseph and, uh, and not realize that according to the Bible, this is the apex of his life spiritually. In other words, of all the events of Jacob's life and all the things he's been through, all the things that he's done, according to the Bible, this is the most important thing that he did. This is the one thing they make a comment on. So I'd say it's probably pretty important, isn't it? And uh, it is interesting, and it's, uh, it's filled with lots of drama for, for uh, uh, reasons other than the fact that it's kind of some of the last things he says, and he's dying. And this is his son that he didn't see for 20 years. This is his son that he thought he would never see again. He's going to make reference to that. I never thought I'd see your face, and now I even see your, your grandchildren. Now I'm able to, uh, to bless them uh, as well. Uh, and notice also in that verse, it says as he was doing this, he was worshiping the Lord. Because what he was doing was he was banking everything that he knew, everything that he had on the promises of God. He was completely trusting God for his future, the future of his family, based on the Abrahamic covenant. And God says when he was doing that, he was worshiping. He wasn't singing a song, wasn't playing an instrument, he wasn't even reading the Bible. He was just believing and trusting God completely with his life. And, uh, and the Bible calls that uh, worship. We, uh, we sing, often sing a song about the idea of submission and surrender to the Lord. And, uh, and Jacob's had those moments and kind of retracted, you know, at the river Japheth where he wrestles with God during the night and God disclosed, this uh, locates his hip. He limps the rest of his life and God changes his name from, from Jacob to, uh, to Israel, governed by God. But he kind of retracts from that and pulls back. I know none of us ever do this. I mean, once we're committed, man, we're just committed. But Jacob does this. And he kind of begins to pull back and not always trust God. And then there's these other occasions where God comes in and invades his life again. And then kind of the last big scene that we have with him is when his sons need to go back to Egypt one more time. And they've got to take Benjamin. Of course, he didn't want him to go. Uh, and in the end, he says, that basically, take him, take Benjamin. And if I never see him again, I'll never see him again, but I'm going to trust God. I'm kind of paraphrasing here. But again, it's one of those moments of, of complete surrender to whatever God has for him uh, in the future. And, uh, and it's great to see that at the end of his life, he has one of these moments again. It's the moment the Bible says, according to Hebrews 11, is the apex of his faith. Well, let's look at first in terms of this blessing, the preparation. Uh, Jacob prepares to bless the sons of Joseph and We'll see three, three uh, reasons for doing that, as well as a, a very touching remembrance. Verse 1, Now it came to pass after these things, that Joseph was told, Indeed, your father is sick, and he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob was told, Look, your son Joseph is coming to you. And Israel strengthened himself and sat up on the bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz, in the land of Canaan, and bless me. And said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you. And I will make you a multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. And now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. 
As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Your offspring, whom you beget after them, shall be yours. They will be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. But as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died beside me in the land of Canaan on the way, when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. So three reasons for the blessing, and the, the first is obvious. Uh, it says he's ill, <coughs> and we know from Hebrews 11 he's actually dying, and he seems to, uh, to know that as well. And again, it's very important to note that, that that passage describes this scene is actually worshipped because it's an act of, uh, of submission uh, on his part. Because what he's doing, as we'll see as we get into it a little more, he's basically going to adopt... You know, we might say Hanai, but it's really an official thing that, that he does. And taking these two sons and saying, they're going to be like mine. I think we kind of get that. But we'll look at a cross-reference. He goes, they're not just going to be mine and not your sons any longer. They're going to be my number one son. They're going to take the place of Reuben and Simeon. And, uh, and they get, and again, in the Eastern frame of mind, that's huge. That's, that's everything. That means as the number one son, they get it all in terms of an inheritance and rights and rule and, uh, and so forth. More importantly, he's saying that the covenant promises that I have to give because they've come to me from Abraham to Isaac to me, I have a right to, to do this. So it's a very huge thing that's, that's going on. It's because he's dying. Secondly, he prayer, prepares to bless them again because of the promise, because he has the right to do that. Notice verse 3 again. God Almighty appeared to me at Luz, that is uh, ancient Bethel, or Luz is the ancient name, Bethel is the name we know it of, in the land of Canaan, and blessed me. And again, notice the covenant promises. I'll make you fruitful and multiply you. I'll make you a multitude of people. I'll give you the land. These are the promises given to Abraham and to Isaac. So the appearance he mentions too. The first one is when he's running away from Esau, his, his brother, whom he deceived to get the birthright from his father. Esau basically says, uh, when I get the opportunity, I'll most likely kill you. And so he flees. Uh, and on his journey before he gets out of the land uh, of Israel, as we would come to know it, uh, he lays down one night, puts that stone under his head as a pillow and has that vision of the angels ascending and descending. And then the promise from uh, God above, I'm going to go with you, I'm going to watch over you, I'm going to protect you, I'm going to bring you back. And basically uh, says to him that you are the promised one. You are the one uh, that is going to get the blessing. And then all of the years of laboring, seven years he labors, thinking that he's laboring for Rachel. And then the deception by good old Uncle Laban ends, ends up marrying Leah, finds that out the next day. Labors an additional seven uh, years. He's there for about 20 years. He finally comes back into the land. Comes to that same place again, Bethel, the house of God. God appears to him uh, a second time and echoes the promise uh, made earlier to be fruitful uh, and multiply. So he says, I'm the promise bearer, therefore I can give the promise and pass the promise on to the heirs that I choose. And so he's going to do that with Joseph's sons. Now, there's a, a part of this where Joseph is probably uh, pretty excited about that, but there's also an aspect of this where uh, this is probably very difficult for, uh, for Joseph as well. In a sense, he's going to lose his sons uh, in a way that uh, uh, is very important to understand. Uh, the, so he's very ill. He's about ready to die. He's got the authority. Those are two of the reasons. The third one is he's going to bless the sons because he... Uh, again, we'll count them as his own. We see that in verse 5. Now, the literal Hebrew says, like Reuben and Simeon, they will be to me. So uh, they will be taking the place of Reuben. And we find that cross-reference in 1 Chronicles 5.1. I've got that for you, and here's the clarification on what's really going on here. Now, the sons of Reuben, uh, the firstborn of Israel, he was indeed the firstborn. But because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that the genealogy is not listed according to the birthright. Yet Judah prevailed over his brothers, and from him came a ruler, although the birthright was Joseph's. 
So it's not just that he's going to adopt them. He's going to adopt them and make them uh, the, the number one uh, son. He, he makes, uh, mentions the fact that uh, twice he claims them as himself. Uh, uh, they become the replacement for their much older uncles. And, uh, uh, and everything uh, kind of changes at, at this point. He anticipates the question, of course, that uh, Joseph would have had in terms of what about the rest of my kids. Verse 6, your offspring whom you beget after them shall be yours. Uh, but these guys, they'll be called by the name of their brothers in the uh, inheritance. So there's three reasons for the occasion of the blessing. He knows he's about ready to die. He is the covenant bearer, therefore he can pass it on to someone else. Uh, but to do that, he's not going to give it to Reuben. He's not going to give it to Simeon. He's not going to give it to any of his other kids. And it's interesting that he's not going to give it to Joseph either. Uh, I, apparently there's a, again, God is orchestrating all of this and there's certainly the understanding that Joseph will, will never go, make it back to the land but by his bones being delivered there at a point in time in the future and Jacob will make reference to that and his belief in that so he uh, passes it on to the, to the grandsons at, uh, at this point. Now, I made reference in the first service to the fact that there's, uh, if, you're, if you're Japanese or from the East or whatever, you, you get the concept. Oldest son. Oldest son gets, gets everything. Uh, when uh, Kathy's uh, uh, uncles all worked on the farm, all worked and, and so forth, but they all worked for the oldest son because the oldest son was the Luna. He called the shots. And when <coughs> Obama, the Jeezy, passed away, then the oldest son gets everything. And he gets everything. <laughs> it's like nine kids, but he gets everything as far as the house and everything. It seems uh, strange in our Western minds. I, I, we like to think of equal, equal for everybody. That's just not the way uh, it was done. I know that's kind of changing now. But anyway, just to kind of have that, that frame of mind uh, that uh, this, this is a huge thing, that, uh, that they become the, uh, the number, one, number one son. But in the midst of all of this, in this preparation, uh, he remembers Rachel. And that's in verse 7. It's like he's going through this. It says, but as for me, when I came from, from Padan, but on around, Rachel died beside me in the land of Canaan on the way, uh, when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath. And I buried there on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. So he remembers Rachel. I think he remembers Rachel for a couple obvious reasons. One is there's Joseph standing before him, her son. Of course, it's giving birth to Benjamin that she dies. And you can tell or should sense in this that, that it bothers him. Uh, they, they never even made it to Bethlehem. They never made it to Ephraim. He would have never wanted to bury her there. He would have wanted to bury her in the cave at Machpelah where Abraham and Sarah were and where Isaac and Rebekah and where he will be buried but she's not there, and she won't be there. And, uh, and he knows that, and there's, uh, th there's that aspect to it. And it's also because he's, he's looking at Joseph. Two things that we know about, about uh, Joseph and his mother is they were, they were well, they were beautiful. I mean, the, uh, Rachel was beautiful. It says that uh, over and over again in, uh, in several passages. And then when, when uh, her son Joseph is born, and he is described, and described later as a teenager, as a young man, uh, there's, there's basically says he's incredibly handsome and he's buff, he's ripped, he's, he's got a great physique. It's very clear we went through that. Uh, I think that indicates he looks a lot more like his, the mother, you know, as far as the facial features, uh, than the dad, which, you know, you can see that in kids sometimes. And uh, maybe have that in your own family with some brothers and sisters. I got a sister that's kind of a dead ringer from my mom, you know, and it's, you know, it's kind of... <laughs> Or to uh, look at her and not think of my, my mom, you know, who's with the Lord and stuff. Uh, and I think there's a lot of that dynamic uh, going, going on here as well. Rachel had been, again, the love of his life, worked 14 years uh, that he might uh, marry her. And, uh, and again, their life together was certainly not long enough. And, uh, and there's this issue of uh, the remembrance of her. I'm going to... You know, again, Joseph is this outstanding young man, uh, follows God, walks with God. We say a type of Christ in terms of his incredible forgiveness and grace and incredible wisdom, the way he orchestrates the events to bring this transformation in his family and so forth. Uh, and now here, 
again, it's, I don't think that he's even, you know, disappointed in this in the sense that the blessing's not going to go to him. It's going to go to his sons. Uh, I think that he's probably excited about that, uh, but understand there's a submission in his life as well for this reason and just kind of to bring this all together, like things that we already know. Jacob and his family were shepherds. They lived in Goshen, right? And what were they to the Egyptians? Abomination, right? They will never fit. They will never get along. They will never go anywhere. They will never amount to much in this culture. Who's, who's Joseph? Well, he's Egyptian, basically. He is the viceroy. He's the prime minister. He is the, the lord of the land. He lives in a palace. He doesn't live in a tent. His children, his number one son, I'm sure he's being groomed to have a position within that government that he runs. And, uh, and that will never happen. That will never happen. Because they will become the sons of Jacob. They will become shepherds. They will live in a tent. And they will be an abomination to the Egyptians. And they will have nothing to do with him, his family, the culture, and all the future that he thought that they would have as his sons. Is that, is that all pretty clear? Make sense? So that, that's what he's giving up. So when, when his father is dying and word comes, bring your two sons, your dad is going to bless them. And then, he, well, that's great. And now he's going to adopt them. Wow. That's, that's a game changer. It's just, it's just not going to, it's not playing out the way he pictured that it would. But he, he does it, right? I mean, he goes along with it because of his faith, because he believes the promise. He believes God will give them the land. He believes that the Messiah will come through them. He believes that he's, he's on board with all of that. So if it means I've got to give up my kids and their future and their life and what I thought it would be, he's okay with that. So it's, both of these guys, it's pretty amazing, uh, the little drama that's, uh, that's being worked out here. Verse 8 we'll get to in a moment, but uh, even this, before we get to it, is uh, an interesting little, little thing to know. That when, when he's there and he's with his sons, uh, Jacob begins this official adoption ceremony by saying, by saying, who are these? It's the way we begin a wedding ceremony. Who has brought this woman to be married this day? I would say from up front, typically. And, uh, and then the, the, the dad... The father, who has walked the bride down the aisle, responds, her mother and I. And then we begin the wedding ceremony. And that's a little bit of what's going on here. Who has brought these? This is a kind of a, you know, it's a ceremony. Uh, Jacob is dying, but he wants to make sure it's very clear who the covenant is being passed on to and that he's adopting these two sons. Uh, secondly, in verses 18 to 16, we actually get on to the blessing itself as he places his hands on the sons of Joseph in order to bless them. Verse 8, Then Israel saw Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? There's our line. Joseph said to his father, They are my sons whom God has given me in this place. And he said, Please bring them to me and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see. And Joseph brought them near and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see your face, but in fact, God has also shown me your offspring. So Joseph brought them from beside his knees, and he bowed down with his face to the earth. That's, that's Jacob, and that, that kind of ends the ceremony. That's the conclusion. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim, uh, with his right hand uh, towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh with his left hand towards Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. Then Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, uh, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn, and he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Let my name be named among, upon them and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude uh, in the midst uh, of the earth. So they, uh, we first say he places the hands as they draw near, verse 13, 
And, uh, and of course, uh, I mentioned there in reading that when he gets down and bows down, that's kind of the end of the adoption part. They're now his, so that had to get done. Now he's going to bless them as his sons. And as we're going to see uh, uh, in the uh, subsequent chapter, in chapter 49, he's going to call the other sons in and prophesy. In a sense, bless, but he ends up prophesying over them. And that's what's going on, in a sense, for Joseph's sake uh, in terms of the, of the two sons. But in placing them in, of course, uh, uh, Joseph is trying to help his father. So he's going to take Manasseh, the older one, and put him right here. So he's at the right hand. He's going to take Ephraim and bring him right here so that Jacob could simply go like this, lay his hands on the two boys, uh, and then pray this, this blessing uh, upon them. Uh, if you haven't ever seen or get a, a, a grasp of what's going on, but he goes like this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, which was uh, shocking to, uh, to Joseph. It wasn't just shocking. We'll see, he's kind of ticked off uh, about the whole time. <laughs> it's the only time. You ever see, you ever see uh, uh, Joseph kind of get in the flesh a little bit? Uh, interesting. The New Living puts it this way to kind of make it real crystal clear. But Jacob crossed his arms as he reached out to lay his hands on the boys' heads. Uh, he put his right hand on the head, head of Ephraim, though he was the younger boy, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, though he was the, the firstborn. So he does that. He places his hands on them, the adoption procedure, procedure being done. He places his hands secondly, and he pronounces the, the blessing. Of course, as I said, Joseph is uh, probably dumbfounded, uh, speechless, uh, not sure what to say uh, at this point. Uh, and then there's this threefold invocation uh, from verse 15 uh, and 16. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, identifies that the God that he is speaking about, uh, already referred to him as the God Almighty, uh, the God who fed me all my life to this day. This blessing is practical. God will take care of you. God has always taken care of me. I had to leave the land. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what would happen to me. I didn't know if I would be killed when I returned from Esau. But all the days that I've walked with God, God has always taken care of me. So the blessing is very practical. And then he mentions the angel who has redeemed me and protected me from evil and so forth. Uh, the blessing again is in the name, in the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. Again, he is the promise bearer. He can give the promise away. And the blessing involves the future. And let them grow into a multitude in the midst uh, of the earth. Again, the command to Adam and Eve initially was be fruitful and multiply. Uh, we find that combined with the promises made to Abraham of the land, of the seed, uh, and, uh, and the multiplication of descendants here uh, as well. So he is, in a sense, preparing to die. And as he does, he's going to bless Joseph's sons. He's got to adopt them first. He does it because, well, because of his illness. He can do it because of the authority that uh, God has given him through the Abrahamic covenant. He's got to adopt the sons first. But the shock of that is he makes them his number one sons. And then secondly, he places his hands on them. And we're going to look at Joseph's reaction to that uh, in a moment. Because this is very shocking uh, to Joseph to see his father do this uh, and begin to pronounce this blessing. Look at verse uh, 17 as we'll see that Joseph did not want to accept the preference given to the younger son. Now when Joseph saw his father laid his right hand on the head, head of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, by you, Israel will bless, saying, May God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And thus he set Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am dying, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you one portion above your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. First thing we'd say is Joseph is angered by the preference. 
uh, again, look at verse 17. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it. That means like firmly with force. So when, so when, when Jacob does this to bless the younger kid over here, Joseph goes, not so fast. <laughs> and he's, he grabs it pretty good uh, to, to pull it away. Like you're making, you're making a big mistake here. Uh, notice that verse 17. And again, this is an abrupt command. Not so, my father. I mean, it's like, it's kind of respectful, but he's, uh, he's obviously up, upset by this. He's angry. Uh, and secondly, we'd say he's appalled. Uh, because in every tradition, whether it was from the Egyptians and the Nile all the way to the Euphrates, uh, every family, it's the older son that gets blessed and not the younger. And so he is certainly uh, shocked by this. And uh, Manasseh was probably humiliated by this. I mean, this is Joseph. He's, these are his kids. Joseph's always been very faithful to God. Uh, he's God's servant. God's blessed him in a tremendous way uh, because of the fact that he forgave his brothers that sold him into slavery and beat him and stripped his clothes off of him and so forth. And He overcame that by trusting and believing that God's presence was with him, that God had a plan and purpose. He rots away in a dungeon and is finally elevated to this palace. He's gone through all of this. God gives him two children. He names them Ephraim and Manasseh. And in the naming of the kids in Hebrews, he's saying that that God has been good to me even in the land of my suffering. And now this time comes. And God's, and he's willing. He's willing to give his kids. And their, their, their lives are going to be altered forever in terms of their life and their lifestyle. But he believes the promises of God. He's trusting the promises of God. And then God says, but it's different than you think. And I'm sorry that maybe you told your older son all along that he would be the one. And I'm sorry that you raised him up and told him how important it was for his character and his integrity to be intact because he would lead the family, your family one day, his own family one day, that he would be the number one son he's meant to be in that culture. And everybody knew it. And Joseph would have poured into his life. And he says, but it's just not going to happen that way. This, this is all kind of tough to swallow, don't, I mean, for, for Joseph. But for, for Manasseh as well, this is like total... Total shock. And that's why Joseph is ticked off. And he's like, you're, you're making a mistake here, old man. <laughs> and he's kind of trying to grab his hands like, you, I know you're blind, but I don't know you're that blind. And, um, and Jacob reassures Joseph the preference is, uh, is, uh, is no mistake. And, um, and there's a reason that he's crossed uh, his hands. Uh, and in a sense... This had to be really tough for uh, for Jacob. Did he love Joseph? Man, more than anything. Mourned for him for 20 years, thinking he was dead. And, and pretty much said, I'll go to my grave, and I'll never rejoice. I'll never have another happy day. I will just mourn until the day that I die, because I lost my son that I loved. And now, man, he's exalted. He's the Lord of the land. He's Man, he's made it. He's walked with God. He's, he saved the people. Not just that family. He saved hundreds of thousands of people in North Africa because he was, of his wisdom and his obedience to God. I mean, man, how much prouder could you be of him? But he says, well, I hate to do this, but I'm going to have to really disappoint you. And I know this probably really hurts you, but I'm going to be obedient to God. Wow, that's submission. I mean, that's, that's kind of what we're talking about here. Both of these guys, incredible submission to, to the Lord. Jesus said, if you, want to, if you want to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you'll lose it for me and for the kingdom of God, then you'll save it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? Not that anybody could gain the whole world. But even if you could, you would still lose it in the end. And I like that translation in Mark, because Jesus puts his emphasis to his guys that he's with on that occasion that uh, if you'll lose your life, not just for the gospel, for me, if you'll just keep following me and the gospel, then you'll really find life, a life that's really worth living. And certainly that's the, uh, the ultimate submission that we should have to, to Jesus Christ. I, uh, I'm talking with the young guys that are uh, in, in the military, including my son, Sometimes I'll ask them what, uh, you know, how it's going and what their CEO's life and, uh, is like. And, and, uh, and you get the mixture of, uh, of uh, opinions. And, uh, but once in a while, once in a while, 
you'll hear a phrase, and the phrase is, uh, I would follow that guy anywhere. And, uh, and, and of course, it's the obvious meaning to that, is that they have so much respect for that guy, that leader, that they would follow him into battle. They would go risk a life because that's the best way to go. If we're going to get out of this, it's going to be with that guy because that guy knows what he's doing. <laughs> I was uh, <coughs> told you about my little kayak adventure. I've paddled in a long time, and, I, and we, uh, we did the uh, peninsula around, around the Marine Base. With, uh, Tom and I went out with uh, Bob Tuga and some guys, and Bob's a very expensive, uh, experienced kayaker. And back in the day when uh, we were younger, he was trying out for the Olympics and all that stuff. He was a very competitive uh, uh, paddler. He's got a business here in, uh, in Kailua. And uh, anyway, we, this was supposed to be an, an easy paddle, supposed to be calm winds and all this stuff. Hey, we're just going to paddle out here and go out. There's a couple of big islands out there, a big cave you can paddle in and stuff. And man, it turned out to be about eight and a half miles, and the wind had come up. And when we started, it was just dead in the wind and the chop. And, and there was way too many people, and a lot of them shouldn't have been out there. <laughs> but uh, so as we're going, it's like Bob's. Bob's got the walkie-talkie, he's got the waterproof cell, cell phone, he's got a megaphone, he's got a whistle, he's got uh, flares, he's got, he's the guy. And he's like Mr. Paddler. So I was in his hip pocket. And I was like, I don't care where he goes, I'm going to stay right about five feet off. Because uh, I've been out in the middle of the ocean where uh, this is really bad because I can't see anyone. There's, we're all stretched out so far apart. It's a very uncomfortable feeling when you're out in the middle of the ocean on a little, little 12-foot kayak and uh, no one else is visible for miles, which could only be a few minutes uh, at that level. It's like, I don't think I want that to happen. And I just, I just wanted to get in his hip pocket because he's the man. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what I did. But, uh, you know, there are times where Young guys are willing to say that based on the integrity and the ability of somebody. I'll follow that guy anywhere. And Jesus says, I'm that guy. If you want real living, you'll drop it all and you'll follow me. Because by the way, even if you gain the whole world, it wouldn't be worth anything anyway. Submission. We kind of sing about it. But these two guys, a little struggle going, there's a lot of drama. But Jacob loves Joseph. He would give anything for Joseph. But he says, uh, but I can't go with you on this one. i got to bless the younger one because that's what God's telling me to do. And then Joseph's got to deal with it. And Joseph's got to uh, accept it. Uh, Jacob assures Joseph the, pre the preference is no mistake. And for that, his life is remembered. Again, in Hebrews 11, the one thing about Jacob's life recorded by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. Dr. Barnhouse says, It has taken Jacob a lifetime of divine discipline to learn that he must only speak and do the word of God. Now he dared to trust God and believe his plans were best. He dared to do God's will despite the wishes of his illustrious godly son. Jacob had his anchor into the will of God forever. Isn't that a good line? Jacob had his anchor into the will of God forever. How we wish that, uh, that we could l live right, right there is, uh, is what's described as worship here to, to us. Verse 19, he says, I know my son, I know. He's, he also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he. So and again, both sons were incredibly blessed. And, uh, and as they head out at the Exodus, 400 years later, Moses leading them out of Egypt, following the Shekinah glory of God. Uh, and uh, as they get into the land, God blesses uh, them both. But uh, as you kind of track along with the, the ancient history of Israel, which we've done in studying the prophets on Wednesday nights, uh, we'll find out that uh, when the kingdom splits, uh, you've got two tribes in the, in the south, uh, referred to as Judah, because they're the major player there, Judah and Benjamin. Ten tribes in the north. Uh, and they are known as Israel, but also the prophets call them Ephraim. That's their other name, because they're the major player. Uh, what God said would happen uh, did, did happen. 
And, uh, and again, this whole thing of uh, what we call a crossed hand blessing sometimes can uh, uh, affect our lives as well. We see it repeated again that God does something completely different. Uh, uh, again, it was Abel that got the blessing and not Cain. It was the line of Seth, the younger brother chosen, uh, and not the other sons of Noah. Uh, again, it was Isaac chosen over Ishmael. It was Jacob chosen over Esau. And now these two young men chosen over uh, Reuben. And, uh, and certainly that's a common theme uh, in the Bible and in the New Testament. And it certainly applies to Jesus Christ. And John 1.11 of Jesus has said, He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, not of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It doesn't matter who you are, who your father was, who your grandfather was. You know, Jesus came unto his own and he was rejected. Who gets to be his son, the number one son, the blessed son? Anyone. Anyone that would just come to him. Anyone. It's, uh, that's the amazing thing. Paul makes reference to this idea of God's choosing in 1 Corinthians 1.27 when he says, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put the shame to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So you don't really have to be much. In fact, it's probably better if you're nothing <laughs> to, <laughs> to come to the Lord. And... Uh, uh, what writer said, this is what makes the gospel so wild and wonderful. <laughs> I was thinking the song we were singing at the end, uh, Wildfire, but uh, that's the, uh, the gospel. It's, it's wild and, uh, and it's wonderful. Wild in a good way. I was uh, just, one of the blessings at, uh, at being at the pastor's conference is, uh, we had some great speakers from Mainland, of course. Jack Abelin was there, Don did a, uh, at least one session, Don, Don did one or two, but uh, the rest of the sessions were just by the guys here uh, locally and stuff, and it's it's just a blessing to all the all the varieties of personalities, but they're all such great teachers, and, and like I said, most of these guys I've known for so long. Charles Couch from Calvary Chapel, West Oahu, uh, uh, had the last session, which uh, none of us envy, because you don't quite enjoy the conference when you're the last speaker, because you're kind of waiting for it to, oh, I'm done, oh, it's over now, go home, but uh, anyway, Charles is up there, and uh, it just eloquent. This guy from Nanakuli, who qualification was he worked for Hawaiian Telephone for a while. And uh, God saved him because he was an adulterer and his marriage was falling apart. And he cried out and begged God for forgiveness and God forgave him and healed his marriage. And then, uh, and then he would stand on the stage with me every week uh, with Pastor Bill and he would sing in the in the worship group, and I did the announcements. The, the adulterer and the drug addict would be up there and <laughs> serving the Lord, and we're just like, I don't know if it's good if people know. Bill says, share your testimony. We don't think that's a good idea, really, because I don't think anyone would come if they really knew who we were. And we're just like the typical cross-section of what God was uh, doing in our midst. And passages like this in 1 Corinthians, man, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And uh, that's, that's us. And that's a good thing uh, to realize and how incredible the gospel is. I like this. It's so wild uh, and it's so wonderful. This thing of Joseph in, in his faith, though, has a, a great application. And uh, uh, because I think we can r relate to this idea that sometimes, you know, God wants to bless and, and we've got our right hand on something and our left hand on something, and this is the, really the thing, and the, you know, and it's the, you know, and it, you know, and then God goes, oh. okay, that's not quite the way I saw it coming. So let me just read a quote from uh, Marcus Dodds, who was the uh, Victorian era principal of New College in Edinburgh, as he comments on this whole idea. I took out some of the five dollar words so we could get past the uh, the uh, British language here for our American ears. But he said, again and again for years together, we put forward some cherished desire to God's right hand. And are displeased like Joseph. 
that still the hand of greater blessing should pass to some other thing. Does God not know what is oldest with us, what has been longest at our hearts and is dearest to us? Certainly he does. I know it. My son, I know it, he answers. It is not because he does not understand or regard your natural or excusable preferences that he sometimes refuses to gratify your whole desire and pours upon your blessing of a kind of somewhat different from those you most earnestly covet. He will give you the whole that Christ hath merited. For the application and the distribution of that grace and the blessing, you must be content to trust him. In other words, we're... We have these things, whether it's a job, a position, a relationship, whatever it is. It could be a ministry. It could be a lot of things. And this is my thing. And this is my right hand. And this is what I'm bringing. And this is what I want you to bless. And Joseph, was Joseph a pretty good guy? Joseph was a pretty good guy. I mean, he had been through a lot. Always faithful to God. If anybody deserved it, just God looked down and go, man, God, Joseph wants his, his older kid blessed. Why don't you do it? God says, I've got other plans. And I want Joseph even to trust me in this. And a lot of times, are we not the same way? I mean, we've got our prayer life. We've got our priorities. And sometimes we find out our priorities aren't the same as God. The thing I feel like I need to be so blessed in, he goes, I'm going to kind of skip that for now. and Because uh, I'm kind of concerned about this little thing over here that's in your life as well. That, I don't really, that's great, but I don't really care about that. This is the thing. This is are you, are you watching me down here? <laughs> and God says, are you going to trust me? Because if you do, that's worship. Yeah. And that's what we learned from, from Jacob in this, uh, this instance. And, uh, and again, this whole idea that would be echoed in the life of Moses later, again reading from Hebrews 11:24 by Moses, by faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, as he looked to the reward. And that's what Joseph does here. This is not how I see my kid's life. But Lord, if that's what you want, bless them, Lord. they got to live in a tent. That's, that's all right, Lord, if your hand's on them and, and you bless them. And uh, so there's a real submission by both of these men. But it's difficult. Uh, I think it's very hard uh, on, on both of them. And, of course, from a world point of view, Egyptian point of view, uh, this was ludicrous what, what Joseph was doing. Uh, but he, he did it anyway. Last thing, Jacob comes back with his assurance for his son that he loves so much. Uh, and that he will have a place in the land. Verse 21, then uh, Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I'm dying, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you one portion above your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my, my bow. So this is the land that he purchased in, uh, in Shechem. Uh, as you recall, that whole episode really wasn't where God wanted him to be. Should have been in Bethel, but he uh, turns and gets away from Esau. Instead of trusting God, goes to Shechem. Uh, and then they come out basically and say, do you want to dwell among us? And then, uh, sure we do, we'll just buy some land here. And they charge him this outrageous amount of money, and he pays it anyway. It's the only land he ever bought. Uh, of course, terrible things happen after that, but he still bought the land. So he says, God will deliver us. God will bring us up. God will take us back into the land. And when he takes you back into the land, you have a place to be buried there in the land that I purchased. And later, at the Exodus, under Moses, when they're leaving under the cloud of God, that uh, they're carrying the ossuary bone box or the mummified remains of uh, Joseph. And as they enter the land under Joshua and they take the land, and they take this land that belongs to Ephraim, that's where Joseph is buried. And, uh, and this uh, word comes true to him. But uh, again, amazing the, the drama between this, uh, this father and the son in the idea that I've only got a, a, few, a few days left, a few words left, and uh, these are the things I, I've got to say. These are the things that are the most in, uh, important to me. 
I've had occasion to be with a few people on, on those kinds of, of uh, uh, situations. <clears throat> and I was thinking about this week, this idea of last words kind of a thing. And I was thinking about uh, when uh, I knew that my mom was uh, going to be with the Lord soon. And we'd flown uh, up to California and uh, to spend a couple of weeks there. We didn't know if she had um, weeks, months, or whatever. But uh, she had had heart failure. And, and it's just, uh, if you have diabetes, uh, then that's the, uh, the outcome eventually. Uh, you can have drugs that help you sustain your life, but eventually the outcome will be uh, heart failure. And, uh, and that time is coming pretty quick. And she actually sat down with, uh, with me and my dad and said that uh, she wanted to talk about her funeral. It was one of these kind of conversations, last words. And uh, we went through the songs that would be sung, the hymns that would be sung, the songs that would be sung, planned out the whole thing. And then she... Uh, and then, and then uh, gave, gave me the scriptures that she wanted read, uh, and then said uh, that she wanted me to then preach the gospel really hard, because all of my siblings and their husbands and wives are, all know the Lord, they're all saved. There's lots of nieces and nephews uh, of mine, her grandchildren, that are not saved. And uh, they would all be there, of course, for grandma's funeral, and she wanted them to hear it one more time, really clear. That was her, that was her wishes. That was her blessing to them. That was the, ble the best thing that she could bless them with, is to, to be able to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and make a decision, and make sure they knew, if they ever want to see me again, I'm going to be in heaven. And there's a way that they can come and join me there. That's the best I could, what I, what I delivered. And I just pray that, that we wouldn't have to wait to the end to get this dependent on God and this submitted to God. Amen. I mean, it, although I love the idea that you can get to the end and that's, that's the apex of who you are as a believer in Jesus Christ and go out on a note like that, that sounds pretty cool as well. You just kind of hope it just, just keeps getting, getting better all, all the time. Uh, and it will. If, um, if we look at Jesus and go, I'll follow that guy anywhere. Because that's what he's really asking us to do. Well, let's pray. Father, we, we thank you that um, when you ask us to follow you and submit to you, it's, just, it's not this blind leap of faith. If anybody ever deserved to be followed and obeyed, it's you. You're so good to us. You're so gracious. And you know everything. You know what's best for us at all times and all occasions. Lord, and you know what will be most fulfilling and give us that truly abundant life. Lord, I just pray that we could, and it's a daily thing, Lord. Maybe today we can lay it all down. I pray that uh, by your grace we could do it tomorrow and the next day as well. And just learn to trust you. And Lord, we need to see you in your word and learn more about you so that we understand your integrity and your goodness and that uh, you're worth trusting. And Lord, help us grow in that trust in our faith and our, in our walk with you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.